Okay, so I believe we are all here. Thank you very much. I want to introduce myself. My name is Daniel Timmons. I'm a trustee in the States, another law attorney uh, here in New York City. Um, interesting times we have the last few days. Go figure. We would have thought that uh, we would have had what we've been having take place, take place. But the world continues. It goes on. Uh, and so let's all do our best to try to stay focused and try to learn a little bit about the markets today. I've invited today two wonderful speakers. I have a Michael Luffman and Edward Zhang. Michael Luffman is the Executive Vice President and the Head of Wealth Management at Fortis Lux Financial. Uh, and Ed is the Director of Portfolio Management with him. They are just wonderful. I've gotten the chance to work with many of Michael's clients that he's worked with some of mine. Uh, just can't speak highly enough about not just to him and his staff, but also uh, the clients that he works with. Uh, the idea today is that we're going to be looking at constructing uh, constructive portfolios, proper portfolios in these times of the coronavirus. Uh, I'm going to sit back and let Michael and Ed drive. If people do have any questions, I ask you to ask them via the Q&A question bar at the bottom or top of your Zoom screen, depending on where you have the toolbar for Zoom. Without any further ado, uh, Michael and Ed, uh, please take it away. Thank you, everyone. Dan, can you hear me okay? I can. You're a little bit uh, silent, but I think you're a little better now. There you go. Okay. Yeah, it was just a, it was some background noise earlier when you started speaking, so I just wanted to make sure. Good morning, everybody, and thank you so much for taking time today. Uh, you know, it's an honor. I get to meet with a lot of Dan's clients, and, uh, you know, certainly we have the opportunity to build friendships and, and clients along the way, but every time we do a call, it seems as though every week our script is changing rapidly, and uh, the funny thing was for the last few weeks, we had said, let's not get complacent. And then sure enough, obviously with what's going on now amongst the riots and, and all that, it's certainly things are, uh, are taking a turn, I think, in the wrong direction. But again, uh, you know, we do a lot of these calls and uh, my partner, Ed, who's the lead portfolio manager on my team, um, we try to kind of go on a 30,000 foot presentation and then get a little granular uh, for some clients that are interested, but uh, we'll try to keep this overall presentation within 20 to 30 minutes and leave it open for Q&A. Uh, we have some questions that have been asked to Dan already, and we also have questions that our clients have asked us. So we'll, um, if there are no questions, we can uh, certainly address some comments that we don't cover um, in our initial dialogue. Uh, so first, before we start, you know, I always start off with, uh, you know, wishing everyone the best health-wise. Uh, certainly there's probably some individuals on this call that have either had the virus or know someone who had or suffered from the virus. So we certainly want to wish everyone the best. Uh, you know, we've been, Ed and I have been having these calls with clients regularly. Uh, we manage about a billion dollars. So we, we really try to have these calls almost every other week. Uh, but I just wanted to spend a minute and kind of describe who we are. Uh, so you kind of get the essence of how we're going to make this presentation. Uh, Ed and I have both been doing this 23 years. My partner, Steve Cohen, who presented several weeks ago, is also an attorney and a financial planner. Uh, we are a full wealth management service firm. We are not stock pickers per se. Uh, we do financial planning and we manage money. So I always like to start with that because a lot of our decision making is driven on asset management, but it's also driven on goal-based financial planning. And I think that's important because, uh, you know, I think in these markets, uh, sometimes you have to get past the smoke and understand why you're investing a certain way and what your goals are with the money. Because uh, if you have a long-term time horizon versus a short-term time horizon, you're going to stomach and weather this slightly different. But this is also a great test as you're in retirement uh, now taking income, how do you make sure that you can maintain your lifestyle? And certainly there's been a tremendous recovery already. Uh, I just had a call right before this with a client, and uh, she, they both said, actually, you know, we don't, haven't looked at our statements. How bad is it? And I said, you're down 1% this year. And they thought I was kidding. They thought I said 1% for June. Um, and I said, no, 1% for the year. I said, the stock market's only down about 5% year to date. The Dow is down about 10%. But the world index is still down about 15% from January 1st, not from the high. So we're obviously we're seeing a huge recovery in a weighted index like the S&P 500, but the global index is still down about 15%, and we're still down 20 plus percent from the highs that we had experienced earlier. So we do believe we're way ahead of ourselves, uh, and we'll talk about that, but also we kind of want to give you an idea of where everything is today. 
And since March, I've used this line and we've been right. We've never expected a V-shaped recovery or a U-shaped recovery. Up to this point, we're still sticking with the idea of a square root sign. So if everyone's familiar with the square root sign, we had a precipitous drop downward. We had a nice quick recovery to where we are even today. Um, and our feeling is that we're going to be leveling off. We don't expect a full recovery uh, back up to where we were at the highs anytime soon. Um, and we do think we're a little bit ahead of ourselves. So that square root sign that we've been using with our clients since um, early, the first call we had in March, uh, we're still sticking with now. Uh, we don't see a W. We don't see another 30% drop in the market, even if the virus does come back in the fall. And we'll talk about that. Um, but I also want to make sure it's clear, you know, in, 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 in two huge economic cycles that we've had, you know, doing this 23 years, I've never used a depression in my comments, but now we have been. But if you go back to the, the depression, you know, the stock market was down 80%, but it took less than two years and the stock market was up 150%. So if you just think about that swing of negative 80% to positive 150% in less than two years, markets do recover but it took almost nine years for every sector of the economy to recover. So the stock market doesn't move necessarily, you know, step in step with each sector of the economy. And you can even look today is where the market is versus you look at, you know, travel and leisure and certain sectors that are just completely battered and have not recovered. Even in 2008, it took three years for the stock market to recover or a little less, about 30 months for the stock market to recover, but it took seven years for every sector of the economy to recover from the credit crisis. And if you put that in also perspective, I think there was $800 billion of TARP money and other money put together to get us out of the credit crisis. Now there's potentially three to $4 trillion put together to get us out of this crisis. So, you know, keep in mind something we always remind clients, it's a health crisis that's turned into a financial crisis. And we can get out of this health crisis with a vaccine, which, again, is not any time in the short term, but understand that there's a lot in play to help support the financial markets. Um, and certainly, there's been a tremendous amount of progress since March. But the Fed and our government has clearly said they will support markets in any way. And that is incredibly important on why we think there'll be some limit on the downside in stocks even from here. So we think the S&P 500 is about, at about 3,000. We'd be very surprised, I guess, if we saw the S&P go below about 2,600 because of tremendous support, both in the markets themselves as supporting, you know, and uh, moving averages, but also on the Fed and what's monetary and fiscal policy that's been put into place. It would take a tremendous amount of wave of new infections uh, in the fall, which are not out of the question, um, but I would think even with that, we think that would still uh, not bring us back down to the levels that we saw before. Even with the rioting going on, we've been having questions just in the last uh, you know, 24 hours, what effect we'll have. And what's interesting is we're not doctors. So, you know, we, we all rely on Dr. Fauci and everybody else for information. And quite frankly, no one's been right. So, you know, I think that's important when you look at your investments and how you're allocated. But the huge safety net that's in place will help us. But also keep in mind that it's not going to get us higher from here. So we're, we're comfortable. There's a lot of support, but that doesn't mean we're going to continue to move higher from here. There's still a long way to go, not to mention an election uh, going on. So we always use the term economic normalization and calm geopolitical events, which are not really calm right now, are not going to necessarily drive us higher. Um, but there is complacency. So we think in the near term, we're considering ourselves roughly in the top of the market. Uh, this morning, we had our, our team uh, call with our uh, portfolio manager, Ed, who's on the line, and the three analysts that work underneath him. And we discussed the fact that, you know, we're not that far off from starting to take or trim some of the equity gains we've already had in this recovery. So, you know, we're uh, never going to sit around and watch things happen. We're always looking to trim into strength. And in this case, we see that the markets have recovered nicely. We're in the process of thinking we might start taking some more equity off the table. So we look at this market currently as a whole. Uh, again, our economy is heavily service-oriented and consumer-oriented, and so that's not happening anytime soon. And we used the analogy in our last call, and I thought I would cha change it up a little bit. We used the Jaws movie. You know, back in the Jaws movie, everyone was afraid to go swimming uh, when you heard about sharks. So I guess the analogy now is the beaches are open. Um, and people are kind of going in the water. And the analogy is that the virus is still out there. So I, I like to say the sharks are deep in the ocean. 
Um, but no one said that they're not going to come back to shore anytime soon. So I think that's the fear we have. I mean, things are opening up and here in the New York, New Jersey area, you know, I think we're still much more frightful than other parts of the country and probably better in terms of being more precautionary. Um, but that'll have a role in how the economy recovers. Um, and that's why we think that uh, depending what happens, markets can still go slightly higher from here. Um, but we don't think much higher. And what we need to have happen is economic reopenings. We obviously need a vaccine, and we continue to need the government to uh, give us support. To that point, I guess there are three factors that can continue that rally, obviously, which is where the economy is going to return to normal. Uh, there's obviously right now the markets are pricing in normal very soon, closer to the end of the year. Uh, so that'll be interesting to see what happens. And obviously from a vaccine, we've heard as early as September to as, you know, April of next year. So even if there is a vaccine, it doesn't mean everyone's going to have the vaccine and doesn't mean everyone's just going to go and take the vaccine and start going on vacations anytime soon. But again, that doesn't mean the stock market won't recover. Back in our call, and I was looking at my comments back in late February, early March, we were on a call with about uh, 300 clients, and we had said we'll probably all be quarantined in our homes and the stock market will be higher than it was then. And it's amazing. It went up about 20% since that call. So we'll be interested to see what happens, but that doesn't mean the market will go lower. It just means we think there's a, a lot of hope priced into the markets at this point. So I don't want you to think we're a downers here. Uh, we think the risk reward um, is still okay, but um, you know, doing this a long time uh, when there's not a lot of negativity priced in and uncertainty priced in, that's not also a good sign. So we are being much more cautious in terms of where we are right now. So the market can obviously be, uh, traded in a range. So before I turn it over to the slideshow, I just wanted to use a line that we use for our clients. And we talked about we manage money to be consistently correct, not occasionally brilliant. And I think that bodes well for any marketplace we're in. We always remind clients, you know, we used to joke around, tell clients, hang it on your fridge. Because I think at the end of the day, whether you're a conservative aggressor investor or an aggressive investor, whether you need income now or you're leaving money as an inheritance, you know, when Dan and I and Ed and we have conversations with clients and we think about, you know, pres uh, preserving an estate or generating income to live on, you know, you have to be consistently correct, not occasionally brilliant. And having different asset classes and different buckets of money working for you simultaneously, whether a pension plan or social security or an annuity or bonds or dividend paying stocks, there's never one asset class or one idea that should be uh, uh, covering your overall um, need. It should be a diversification of everything. And that's what gets you through these storms. So as Ed, I'm gonna turn it over to Ed, who's gonna go through a little bit more some of the technicals going on. Um, again, Ed's been my partner a long time. And it, like I said, we manage about a billion dollars of clients' money. And uh, we're going to kind of go through some, uh, some, a little bit more technical than you might see normally and hopefully answer some other questions you have. Uh, with that, I'm going to turn it over to you, Ed. Thanks, Michael. And thanks, Dan, for having us today. I, um, I'll go through a few slides here just to uh, go through what, what we've seen in the past few months. Um, both on the medical front and then also in the markets and then uh, and then also uh, what we see going forward um, obviously there's there's a lot of uncertainty but uh, things are a lot clearer now than they were back in the end of march or beginning of april so uh, we've got a slightly better outlook um, but uh, let me get over to the next slide sorry slight technical difficulty here. Um, <clears throat> so news flows. Um, you know the the new the uh, the case count has um, has continued to grow, but the, the growth rate is um, is leveling off. So that the flattening of the curve that um, that was expected has actually happened. The um, uh, the confirmed case growth and fatalities had peaked in early April, and we are currently at 6 million total cases worldwide. Uh, about 3 million of those, or about half of those, have been resolved, um, and uh, uh, most of the most of the infected have recovered. We um, we have three million cases still unresolved, and we're at 400,000 fatalities around the world. Uh, it's a big number, 
Um, a lot of the, or the lion's share of this is in the U.S. So we've, we've got 1.8 million cases in the U.S., confirmed cases, and we've just breached over, uh, over 100,000 confirmed fatalities in the U.S. So it's a, it's a large number, but um, at least the growth rate of that has now um, started to slow. And we're expecting that, uh, that flattening to continue um, there, there have been a good amount of medical advancements here. I'll get into that in a, in a bit. Um, but the, um, the, uh, on the second bullet point there, the first quarter profit announcements have been weak. Um, we, uh, we were down about 40% on earnings this year. Uh, we're looking to be down uh, approximately 20 to 30% is what most analysts are looking for. 20, 20 to 30% decrease in 2020 as compared to 2019. So it's a, it's a big hit to earnings, but um, with the medical advancements that we've seen and a potential reopening of, a, in, of the economy, if it does go smoothly through the end of the year, then potentially we're back to our 2019 economy in 2021. So we, we could potentially see some decent growth rates in 2021. Um, coming up. So a sharp decline, just like we saw in, uh, in the stock market and the economy um, with uh, Q1, Q2. We're in, the, we're in the heart of it right now in the worst economic numbers. And that, that really horrible economic data uh, is going to be coming in in July. So next month, we're going to get the GDP reads from Q2. We're going to start getting earnings reads. Um, and the, uh, this, this should be the worst of it in Q2. Um, unemployment is, uh, we're going to get the, uh, the, uh, the May read at the end of the week, but as of April, we have a, a 15% unemployment number, and um, that's expected to go to 20% when we get the read um, uh, this Friday. So potentially peaking out at uh, somewhere around 20 to 25% unemployment, and um, and economic output also going to be troughing sometime in Q2, Q3. Uh, hopefully all this government stimulus and Fed action is going to be able to support this and get us back to normal a little bit sooner than we would have without it um, sometime in Q4 or Q1 of next year. So that's what, um, that's what the market is anticipating. Uh, there obviously are, are a lot of ifs and um, you know, hopefully the, the, uh, the medical advancements will be able to get us there and this, uh, this Fed support. And Ed, let me just ask really quickly. I mean, for some people, they hear those numbers and it almost sounds optimistic when you hear you know, 15% unemployment. Uh, there are some people who may think it's closer to 30 or 40%. Is it possible that uh, since the market is a leading indicator that that's why the, the Dow Jones isn't below, you know, 15,000 points at this point, just because they, they feel as though there is going to be a decent recovery in the, eh, let's say the not entirely distant future. Right. Yeah. So that's, yeah, that's exactly it. You know, and that's, and that's what that disconnect that uh, that's been in the headlines disconnect between the, the economy and the stock market, because the stock market is a, is a forward looker. It's a forward indicator. So you know, the stock market typically looks out six to nine months. So right now the market's trying to price in what we look like in 2021. You know, how, how does the economy look? Are we, are we open? Are we somewhat back to normal? Is the consumer spending again? Um, you know, so even though we're at, at some of the worst economic data points with this Q2, um, the, the the, the stock market is look, looking forward into, into Q1 of next year now, which maybe we've got some better data by then. And the, the, the majority of analysts see Q2 and Q3 uh, of this year as being the, the worst of it, the worst of the economic data and the worst of the earnings data for stocks. So yeah, that's, that's the, uh, the, 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 precipitous drop that we saw from February to March, that was pricing in what we, what is, what has already happened in Q2 and Q3. Now we're looking forward into next year and a potential rebound that's going to bring us back to what we, what the, the past earnings power was in 2019. So yeah, the market has risen in anticipation of 2021 and uh, has already looked through the horrible data that we, um, 
that we've gotten in 2020 and what we're about to receive for the, the Q2 and Q3 numbers. And Dan, just to add to something quickly, you know, I guess that's what, you know, as, as financial therapists, I always say, you know, I guess you, we, well, we had we had clients in, in March and, and, and probably a lot of people on this call that felt extremely uncomfortable in the 35, 40 percent drop that we had in the markets. Um, but what we tried to coach our clients on was this is not the time to liquidate or pull equity off. This is a, this is a reminder that maybe you can't take unnecessary risks or you maybe were too aggressive than, or more, you know, more aggressive than you should have been. But we also encourage clients to say, look, this is predicting the worst. Let's see what happens. And, and what we try to do is educate clients. That's why we have these calls because now we're sitting here and having the conversation with a recovery where clients are down, you know, one or 2% versus 15 or 18%. And now we're going back and reminding clients, remember how you felt, well, guess what? Now's the time to say, okay, maybe I should go and trim some of that equity position, or maybe I should put some more cash on the sidelines in preparation for the potential for more volatility if the market isn't as good of a predictor as we hope because things get worse or the virus recovers. So on the call today, if you're thinking, hey, I was, you know, I, mean, I always remember in 08, 09, I remember when the market was down 40 something percent, how many times I spoke to clients, they said, if you just get me back to even, I'll never invest again. Look where everyone does. As soon as they get back, you get back even, everyone stays invested. So, you know, I think the goal here is always this is a good test of character from an investment perspective. How important it is if, when you look at goal based investing, and you know, maybe it is important to look today and say, well, I, I really I, I came back nicely. This is probably a good time to reevaluate my cash or look to take additional income and protect me because the markets are hopeful. And like we say, and we're talking about, we do think the markets are forward thinking. And if we can get out of this, there's a lot of money in play here to stimulate the economy. And the markets can continue to move higher because this was a very healthy economy and a healthy market right before this virus and pandemic took hold. So we think there is potential for growth if we got out of this situation over the next six to 12 months. But it is a good opportunity to look to take some money off the table. So good point, Dan. So on the, uh, on the next slide, it's a uh, Jeremy Grantham quote, be aware the market does not turn when it sees light at the end of the tunnel, it turns when all looks black, but just a subtle shade less black than the day before. So you know, in recent memory, uh, financial crisis, uh, it, the, the market bottom, March 2009, uh, we've, we looked, the economy looked horrible. We, we still had uh, a lot of uncertainty and, and a lot to get through. And um, it, that was the bottom. Uh, this time around, uh, it's in all likelihood, without a second wave of the virus, we've seen the low of the 2191 level on the S&P back on March 23rd. Um, just three trading days before, we had a very esteemed hedge fund manager come out and say that hell is coming. Uh, you know, I can't think of a, a more intense quote to, uh, to make things look pretty, uh, pretty bleak. Uh, the three, three trading days later, the market uh, potentially has, has set its bottom of the 2191 level and now we're you know, almost a thousand S&P points above it. Um, so that was one of the darkest times. We didn't know if we were going to be pushed into a depression. We didn't know how intense the, the virus is, is going to be, uh, or, or was going to be spread, how many infections, what the death rate's going to be. Um, we have a lot more clarity on that now, and it seems it's not actually as bleak. We, after those, after that, uh, the middle of March area, um, we started to get a shade less black. You know, we looked very black in the middle of March. So that March 23rd was really the, um, the, the darkest that it had been. And then we started getting a bit more clarity. Um, and we've been, um, we had a, a somewhat of a V-shaped recovery up through the middle of April. And then we capitulated there for about a month while the market tried to determine what 2021 looked like. And now we're starting to move higher as, uh, as reopenings around the world are starting to go a little bit smoother than anticipated. So on the, uh, on the next slide. And you've been granted control again. Ed. Ah, okay. 
uh, tell you what, why don't, why don't I maintain control for the time being? How's that? Yeah, sound? thanks. Yeah, no problem. We'll just do it like that. You gotta stop fighting me. <laughs> so the, um, this is stock prices bottoming, uh, uh, about two quarters before earnings, S and P earnings had bottomed and this is going back 70 years. Um, you know, the average is approximately two quarters. So if we have a market bottom in, in, uh, in March, then you'd anticipate that, uh, that earnings are going to bottom sometime in Q2 or Q3 of this year. Um, you know, this was a, a very, it, it was a much more severe move down, you know, the shutting down of the economy um, really brought this to a precipitous drop, economic data, earnings data, uh, so potentially this is going to be a little bit more transitory and we're going to see it towards the shorter end um, to be, you know, potentially even one quarter um, from the, the bottom in earnings per share. So I would anticipate Q2, maybe, Q2 is most likely going to be the worst of it. Maybe Q3 will be the, uh, the worst when, you, when you're looking at earnings per share. The only, the only outlier here was uh, the one in red in 2002, so uh, the, uh, the earnings per share bottom was in 2001, and then about a year later, we saw earnings per share um, bottom out. Uh, that was a, spe a very specific time. There was a lot going on, obviously. We had the tech bubble, and then immediately after, we had 9-11, so I would call that an outlier. Um, typically, you, um, you'll see the, the market start to move before earnings uh, just because you've got it's two or three quarters on most of these because the stock market is looking forward that six to nine months so if we're looking forward six to nine months from now uh, i would hope that earnings per share has recovered somewhat uh, by q4 maybe the holiday season or into q1 of uh, of next year but the trough of this most analysts and mo most economic analysts um, are, uh, are looking at Q2 or Q3 this year as being the worst of it. So stocks and economic data. So on the, uh, on the next slide, we have, um, uh, a few things that, um, uh, that we're looking for to stabilize the path forward. Um, so of, around the, um, uh, around the medical advancements, we've got, you know, the, the contact tracing, um, we've got the, the, the progress in treatments, the testing, uh, the things that we've done already, social distancing, maybe we'll, warmer weather is going to help. That's, uh, that's to be determined. There, there hasn't been um, you know, very uh, uh, specific results on whether or not that's going to make a, dis make a difference here. Um, but the fiscal stimulus and the monetary stimulus that we've seen, that really can't be understated. Um, it's, it's an impressive amount of money. It's more than, we've already had more than what we saw through the financial crisis, and it's only been a few months. So that's, uh, that's something that has, has helped to prop up the markets and help the, uh, help the consumer. What we've seen out of Washington, uh, the CARES Act, um, and all the money that's flowing over, the unemployment benefits and things, um, that's helping to support the consumer. Our economy is 70% consumer. So if we're helping the consumer, hopefully that'll help the, uh, help the economy. And then also the monetary stimulus that we've seen, uh, the Fed coming in and buying all sectors within fixed income, that's unprecedented. And it's an, it's an amazing amount of money. We've seen yields drop lower, meaning bonds are, are being priced up or bid up because of all the money flowing into the bond market. And some of that money is flowing out of the bond market into, into equities or other, um, other asset classes because interest rates are very low. So that's, those two things are very important here. Um, on, the, um, on the incremental progress in treatment and more testing, we've got, it's, it's amazing what our, what our medical community has done here, really worldwide coming together. We've got uh, over a thousand registered clinical trials that relate to COVID-19 now. Um, and about uh, about a hundred of them are in stage three clinical trials. So it's uh, it's impressive what the community has done. Uh, there's potential at vaccines by the end of the year, and uh, and some medications by the end of the year as well. So um, 
you know, that's um, hopefully we continue on that path. Uh, I think this reopening is going to be dictated by you know, what we have from the medical community if we have some sort of treatment. Um, that would that would certainly help and help to eliminate the possibility of a more drastic second wave. So on the um, on the next is a, just a visualization of what the the market has done for the year. Uh, that um, that square root sign that Michael alluded to earlier. Uh, we have the precipitous drop. We gained it back and then through the second half of April and into May. The, uh, the market capitulated as to you know, what, what are we going to see in 2021? Are we going to be back to normal or not? Um, since then, uh, in that trading band, we've broken out to the upside, thinking that we are going to get through this um, a little bit sooner than we had thought. And we are going to be back to a somewhat normal economy in 2021. That's what the market is expecting. I mean, those, that's, again, an, another big if here. Um, but um, that's a, the uh, that capitulation through April and May that um, that has broken out to the upside because of the optimism. Um, whether or not that holds true, you know, we uh, we're starting to take down a little bit of equity in some places that we think are overextended here, just in case we don't uh, we don't see that um, that full reopening by Q4 or Q1 of next year. So on the next yeah, slide, Ed, it's funny. Ed, it's funny when we look at these. You know, that chart, we've used that chart now for three, four weeks. We didn't think it was going to be the green arrow. We, you know, so it's interesting how it's really the top op. We really thought it was the middle option. And here we are higher uh, for no specific data. And really, there's been no real medical solution yet. But, you know, I guess that kind of bodes into our, our theory that we're probably a little ahead of ourselves if we continue in this trajectory. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, yeah, medical advancements are certainly helping, um, uh, you know, to, to blaze that path higher. Um, but yeah, we have, we don't have anything definitive yet. It's just anticipation of that. And, um, and then I would say a lot of the move that we've seen is, is from all of the stimulus, you know, they, there's, mm -hmm. there's all that money needed to go somewhere as well. Um, and you've got the Tina problem where some of that money, instead of getting, you know, a half a percent or 1% on, on bonds, we, um, yeah, we're seeing more money flow into the equity markets because there's could potentially be a you know, more relative value in the equity market. Um, you know that that brings me to a point on bonds. You know you, the the bond market has seen such tremendous inflows. We've got bonds trading at drastic premiums. You know they're trading at 120, 130. We know they're going to mature at 100. So you know potentially um, you know the, uh, the people that are holding larger uh, portfolios of bonds, either corporate muni or treasury may want to look at those bond positionings now because they're trading at such elevated levels. You may have negative real yields on those, uh, those bonds if you're holding to maturity. So it's a good time to start analyzing your bond, your bond portfolio and make sure you're taking acceptable risk uh, because the, uh, the risk reward on some of those bonds may be flipped. I've seen some bonds that are you know, high quality investment grade bonds that are going out 10 years that, uh, that, that are at 0.4. 0.3% and inflation is over two now. So you've got negative real yields. It might be time to start taking some of that off. So on the, um, on the next slide, um, we've got, you know, the, the, the movements after these, uh, these drastic declines and a, the, uh, the 250 days trading days in the future, um, whether or not we had a recession. So most of the time, if you have over a, a a 20% decline, you, um, you're going to have a recession. We saw that in most of these cases. And, um, and in the future, if you look forward a year after the, after the decline, you've got a, a nice average um, of 38% in the overall market. So it's the, um, it's a historic perspective. You know, it's, this is in the top there, it says, you know, provided we have a vaccine, I would say a vaccine or at least a, a very effective medication if we're not able to vaccinate yet, but something that would uh, bring the death rate down. So on the, um, on the next slide. So uh, we have, it, both of these, both of those slides are essentially saying the same thing. I mean, we, we have, we, there are some offensive investments, some uh, defensive investments, uh, d 
depending on which direction we go from here. If the reopening actually does continue to go smoothly, uh, we'd want to play offense. When we, we saw movement in sectors like financials, industrials, real estate, utilities, materials last week, that uh, the, those were the outperformers in anticipation that we were going to have a smoother reopening. Those are the offensive stocks now the more cyclical names, the, you know, the, the more value names. It's a little bit counterintuitive, but the defensive names have been the technology and the healthcare and the communication services because those are the names that will hold up re regardless of how long we're, we're uh, social distancing or we're quarantining. Um, you know, some of those names, so some of our large cap tech companies are actually benefiting from all of this because of our reliance on technology when we're, when we're quarantined. So um, it's, it's trying to play that properly, the, um, the defense and offense and picking our spots um, within those sectors. And there are some clear winners now. You know, there, there are clear winners in, um, in those scenarios. There are clear winners if, if we reopen well, there are clear winners if we don't reopen and we have to quarantine again, or if there's, there's a second wave. And then there are some that can thrive in either of those scenarios. So that's um, you know, it's something you need to keep an eye on depending on how the market moves and, and, the, and the sector movements. Um, it's an active approach now that, uh, that has been working a little bit more uh, than just a passive one because you're able to pick some of those winners and losers. On the next slide, uh, same thing here, risk on, you know, so recovery on the, um, on the left-hand side for the offensive and then uh, defensive investments. Um, yeah, this is also showing other asset classes. So the core bond um, portfolio has, has stabilized um, uh, portfolios through this, a 50-50 or moderate portfolio through this year is actually about flat. You know, if you, um, the bond aggregate is up about five, the stock market is down about five now, and you're, you're approximately flat if you had a 50-50 mix of core bond to core equity. So um, core bond did what it was supposed to do, give you that stabilization. Um, I would reiterate if, um, if you have those same core bond positions on, it, it is a good time to take a look at those just because there's been so much money flow into fixed income investments that Bonds are, are elevated, even more elevated than, um, than they were going into this because of all the, the uh, Fed's action. Um, so it, it could be a good time to take a look at, uh, look at that because you've got some very low interest rates, meaning you've, got, you've gotten some very high valuations on, uh, on bonds and other fixed income sectors. On the, uh, on the next slide. This is uh, slightly outdated just because we're looking at May 11th here, but uh, this illustrates what the bond aggregate had done in the SP 500. We, uh, the SP 500 is, has moved up nicely since May 11th, um, and it's brought you back to just about even on a 60-40 on a split between the, uh, the S&P or equity and, uh, and bond aggregate. On the next slide, so this is um, periods of time where active management had, had outperformed passive. Um, and typically it's in these times of crisis where you can pick some clear winners, clear losers. It, passive management has, has certainly uh, been able to outperform active over the past decade. We've had a really nice run up since, um, since, the, uh, since the low that we set on March 9th, um, 2009. And that uh, that passive investor has done very well over the past decade. Over the past few months, we've seen active management outperforming just because we're able to pick some of the, uh, the, the more clear winners and, and, and try to stay away from the clear losers or, or clear sector losers that, um, that we see. And, and just for the perhaps less sophisticated investor who's on the line, uh, Ed, what would you give, give an example or two of what a passive investor or investment is? So a, a passive investment, I would, I would say the, the most used one would just be a, a broad um, index ETF, like an SPY. You're buying the S&P 500, you're buying it market cap weighted, and you're buying all sectors and 
all 500 stocks in, uh, in proportion to their market cap weight. So you're going to have an equal weighting in, in some things like, um, like some energy stocks that really haven't, haven't done very well here. Um, you're not going to be able to overweight some of the technology names that have done very well. Um, you just have a, a, a just a, a, an equal weighting across all 500 uh, stocks according to market cap. So that's just, um, there's, there's no trimming into strength. There's no buying into weakness. It's just buying the broad swath of, um, of stocks that are out there. And same thing on the bond market as well. You know, there are some clear winners, clear winners, losers in the bond market. Maybe you don't want to be buying the, the passive index there as well. Um, you, you could be able to just go into the bond market and, um, and try to pick out some decent yields some decent companies, not take the, the uh, high yield risk, uh, whatever it might be, and just make sure your risk reward is there. So uh, I would say at times like this, when there are crises and, and price distortions, it's good to look under the hood a bit and try to find the best opportunities and avoid the ones that, that might be most at risk. And uh, just to add to that, you know, it really, and even in 2017, this chart's not showing it, but, you know, as, as, you know, someone we do this for a living, there's, we're always using both active and passive. There are times where we want to own sectors um, or we want to own just straight indices like the S&P 500. And there's times when we want to target a specific sector or complement it with, you know, the whole hub and spoke approach, maybe own the S&P, but then build some sectors like technology or healthcare around them. You know, 2017 is the easiest example because the stock market was up 20%. Had you have just bought the growth index, not the S&P 500, the growth index was up 27. If you just bought the value index, you were up 13. So in that example, you know, we didn't tell clients put all your money in growth because, you know, obviously it's hindsight, but we were overweight growth over value in that time. So maybe if the, if the passive index was up 20 and someone was up 24, it's just dialing a little bit better. So in good and bad markets, there's always an opportunity to use passive and active. Um, but, you know, certainly when markets go up, um, uh, it's easier to, to see some clarity on the upside. But on the downside, like we are now, uh, cherry picking sectors and avoiding sectors is critical to getting out of this uh, recovery in, in a good fashion, i.e. travel, leisure, airline stocks. Uh, you know, those types of sectors are not the place to be right now. They're not priced to be attractive and we are avoiding them. So we, we'll touch on those with some Q&A uh, if someone has any questions on sectors that we like versus dislike as well. And let me just dispel the myth really quickly. There used to be this impression that, you know, the financial planning industry, when you had a professional, was avoiding things like passive investments, things like it buying into an index. And, and I can dispel that myth and say, uh, a part of most good financial planning practices is to have at least something in passive investments. It's not just fully active investing um, for whatever cynicism people may have as to that. So yeah, and look, that, you know, a lot of times, yeah, and a lot of times in retirement plans, we'll see individuals use passive investing because it's one of their only choices like Vanguard funds and things like that. In certain cases, clients just want to avoid fees, right? So they look at it that way. So I, I, it all makes sense. It's just there's the combination of it truly works the best because there are a lot of mutual funds out there that just cannot beat their indexes with passive investing. So you can, so for, to pay a, a fund family and have inefficiency on a tax side or pay fees, we, are, we agree. I mean, we're, we're a believer that there are times where you want to use low-cost indexes and passive investing, and then you want to complement it with active strategies around it, depending on the market environment we're in. And, and like Ed said, too, this goes for bonds. You know, there are times you just want to own the general bond index, and there are times you just want to get away from high-yield emerging market and other asset classes. And we're seeing, we're going to start, we thought, look, everyone for years said there's a bond bubble. Um, but at some point, you know, there, that conversation was going to be riskier for bond markets than there are for equity markets. And, uh, you know, right now, if you look at, you could buy an AT&T stock and get uh, AT&T bond and get what, three or 4% for 10 years locking your money up. You could buy AT&T stock and get a 6% dividend. So there's definitely the disparity here in the equity and fixed income markets. And it is going to get quite concerning to be too passive as a bond investor going forward. Sorry. Yeah, it's illustrated on the uh, next slide. You'll see 
illustration of um, what um, what some of the the easiest active manager uh, asset classes are. You know, the um, it's it's harder for um, for U.S. large cap managers to beat just because those markets are a little more efficient. Uh, there aren't those price distortions. Um, it's it's just a, it's just more difficult for a U.S. large cap active manager to beat. It's only about 85% of actively managed mutual funds uh, in the large cap space have beaten in the, in the past decade. Um, I'm sure that'll change this year just because of what we're seeing. But um, you know, there are some areas over time that that active does win, you know, and, and you see it there with small cap stocks, DMXUS, that stands for developed markets XUS. So that would be Europe, Japan, and then EM equity is emerging markets equity. Um, mid caps have a difficult time and the US large caps uh, that has the, the, the most difficult time for managers to beat. But there are some asset classes that are, that are uh, it certainly would, would help to be in active management because you've got some price distortions in some of the smaller companies in the US and then also around the world. Um, and I think that, yeah, so this is um, uh, active outperformance is showing what, uh, what the percentage of unprofitable companies are. So active managers, you know, a good active manager may have, might have been churning some of the travel and leisure stocks in February and March uh, before, the, before the real rundown um, uh, and looking at some of the companies that, that may not be able to be profitable through the year or might not even be able to survive. So active management had paid off by trying to weed out some of those and eliminate them from the portfolios. That's what that, uh, that's what this is trying to illustrate. So uh, back in the tech bubble and right around 9-11, uh, we, um, we had some difficulty there where you saw the percentage of unprofitable companies really spike. A lot of companies didn't survive. Same thing through the financial crisis. Uh, potentially, we'll, we'll see the same thing here where you've got some companies folding um, and we, uh, we've already seen a, a couple looking to enter bankruptcy. So being able to avoid some of the stocks that might be most at risk here certainly will help active managers. And uh, it's really those unprofitable companies and the ones that won't be able to survive this that are, that are obviously most at risk and the ones that you'd want to be able to avoid. So passive management wouldn't be able to do that for you. Passive management just keeps you in all the stocks and you've got an equal weighting and, uh, and that's about it. Um, so active management, if we continue to see this increase in unprofitable companies and companies folding, uh, it's active management that will win out. So most likely 2020 will be a, a good outperformance in active management. And then uh, just something to keep you uh, a little longer term focus. A lot of investors these days, a lot of our clients are looking at the, at the short term, you know, what's going to happen over the next few months or even the next year or just next year, um, you know, the, the market, um, you know, with, with our medical advancements and what we're seeing, you know, I, I would say that the economy should be able to recover back to normal in the next, at least, you know, worst case scenario, people are looking at three to five years. Um, you know, some have it over the next few months or, or next year. Um, so I would try to take a, a bit of a longer term look at investing and not make any, uh, don't make any, you know, extreme moves in your asset allocation. You should, should be properly risk allocated. You should have a, a good amount in equity, a good amount in fixed income, depending on your age. And the fixed income would be able to, to give you a little bit of protection on the downside, just like we've seen, you know, the uh, bond market up 5% for the year so far, with equities down five. So it gives you a little bit of a uh, little bit of protection if there's a down if there's another downswing here, um, but you you wouldn't want to go fully towards one side of the boat there just in case uh, just in case we we recover from this and we continue higher and you you miss out on the run, or if uh, if we have a second wave and we see earnings deteriorate and, and another run down towards the lows you wouldn't want to be fully equity for most investors it's somewhere in the middle. Uh, just trying to determine where that middle is for you that makes you comfortable and that would be able to give you the most upside with protecting your downside as much as possible. And this, uh, this blue line is the overlay 
of, uh, of what we've seen since the the breakout of 2013. That's that's when we uh, that's when we moved up over the 2007 highs from um, uh, that we set before the financial crisis. So from 2013 until middle of 2020, you're seeing seeing that in blue, and then you've got uh, the gray and green lines as comparisons. Those are back in the uh, the 50s and the 80s. So potentially we. we could be able to follow that path as long as um, as long as we're able to get through the the COVID scare here and um, and not have a second wave and our economy will get back to normal um, in sometime in 2021. We uh, we would be able to continue this path if that uh, that is the outcome. Hey, uh, maybe we should just stop here and just leave it for some Q and A since we only have a couple minutes left. Yeah. I know we want to be conscious. Okay, cool, perfect. Great, and that sounds uh, great. I'll, I'll, I'll bring up some of those questions in just a moment. You know, I, I think one of the reasons that the stock market is doing relative to, to past recessions doing so well is because people are actually listening to financial planners. And, and I've mentioned this before, you know, for those of us who lived through the tech bubble and the Great Recession, we see that the market just came back. Um, so we kind of, we kind of try not to time it too much. We kind of grit and bear it. And then lo and behold, we reap the rewards, uh, until the market goes down again. And if you're in cash and, and you were able to get in, uh, you're probably happy that, uh, that you had a little bit of cash on the sidelines. If you didn't have any cash and you remained invested, I think the hope here is that we continue to be in a good position. Um, we did have a request from, uh, uh, resume for the slideshow. Uh, so here you go. I'll, I'll, if if anyone would like to speak of their resume, that's fine. Um, or or uh, ask the speaker. Uh, please reach out to them directly. Let me read some questions really quickly. Uh, question number one: Speaking of a credit crisis, do you think this time we have a bubble of CMBS full of phony mortgages? So are we going to have another 2008 crisis of of bad mortgages at this point? Uh, it's a it's a different type of recession that we're getting into now. I mean, we we might have um, a hit to mortgage and CMBS, but it it with the support that the Fed is giving right now, uh, that doesn't look to be the most probable outcome. So I would say a, a little bit a little bit different this time than uh, than the last time. It's this is more a um, an unemployment recession with uh, with a lot of the travel and leisure and retail. Um, unemployment. Um, so it's, it looks a little bit different than, uh, than what we saw in the financial crisis. So no, I don't, I don't, um, I don't see the, the uh, mortgage backs getting hit as hard as they did a decade ago. And to a, a similar question asked by Andrew W. And what do you expect in the residential home buying market? Basically, are we going to see uh, problems with people purchasing or selling and, uh, and a question I would even ask that is where, I mean, living in, in the village, Greenwich Village in Manhattan, I sure as heck don't feel particularly happy with the current <laughs> location that I live in. But uh, what do we foresee happening financially in the economy uh, regarding residential home buying markets? Yeah, hey, I mean, that's, that's uh, one of the biggest questions right now. Um, you know, real estate has been a very volatile sector as, uh, as the market tries to sort that out. Um, you know, residential, uh, not everything's going to be created equal here. You know, yeah, Greenwich Village, maybe you'll see a, a little decrease in, um, in, um, in home prices. And then maybe surrounding, uh, surrounding cities, you know, some suburbs might see a little bit of an increase as people try to leave the more mm -hmm. congested areas. So I don't think everything will be created equal here. Um, the, uh, uh, just as a side note to that, you know, the, the amount of money that's being poured into the system, it, it should be able to prop up all asset classes and real estate could be one of them here. So broadly, we may see uh, residential hold up. Um, you know, that's, that's a debate that's being had among analysts and it's also a debate that's being, you, know, you can see in the market, you know, the, you can see uh, real estate companies really being thrown around um, and it's not just residential, you know, it's, uh, it's commercial. Yeah. So yeah, it's, uh, and home, that'll be interesting to see what happens. 
again, home builders, luxury home builders and, and, and suburban home builders, uh, you know, they, they tend to be trending up. I mean, they're, they're, they seem to be more optimistic versus obviously commercial real estate, I think, is a lot more in trouble in the metropolitan areas. Um, so it just ran to my neighbor yesterday who's a commercial real estate broker uh, for a large company in New York City. I mean, he's incredibly concerned, obviously. So I think the market itself in general is like every other asset class that's been hurt. But I think that depending on geographic locations and whether you discuss residential or commercial would have an effect on that. Yeah. Great. Yeah. And a vaccine would certainly help, you know, certainly help the cities. That's, so if we actually have one that's working, uh, I don't think people will be as, uh, as leery about uh, city living. And we'll close with this great question from uh, Christopher B. Any thoughts on how the stimulus will be paid for in the, or will be paid out, I should say, in the future, potential effects on income tax, capital gains tax, et cetera. Uh, I'd love to hear each of your answers to that in 20 seconds or less. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Difficult one. Yeah. It, yeah. It, we're going to have to pay for all the stimulus at some point. And yeah, I would say that taxes are going to have to rise. One of the easiest places would be uh, income, uh, ordinary income rates. And, uh, and capital gains tax, you know, maybe we eliminate long-term cap gains rates and we go to ordinary income instead. So it, yeah, I, I would say that's, you know, we probably hear a lot more uh, right around the election when, um, when that comes up um, typically, but yeah, eventually we're gonna have to pay for this and most likely it'll be higher taxes in some form. Michael? Yeah, no, I agree. I mean, I you know you heard the Fed chairman speak about this. I think even on 60 Minutes, he said they're prepared to do anything, and he's not concerned about it. But certainly, it's going to have to be paid. And I don't think GDP growth will fund this entirely. So I think this issue uh, was something prior to the virus, and it will continue to be an issue. Um, but I think the way the Fed sees it, and right now the way the economy is hoping is that no matter what the stimulus is, it will inflate and help. Uh, stimulate the economy and all sectors of the economy, which to them is more important than um, the future uh, payment of this process. And, and this this goes as far as uh, you know, even Social Security and Medicare. I mean, I, I think we could debate this on a whole separate call, but I do think at some point um, this will be an election issue. Uh, no one wants to hear about their taxes being raised, but it is going to be something that has to be addressed. I don't even know if anything's going to happen, quite frankly. I think they're going to keep pushing it off because it can't be addressed yet. People do not want to hear more about money taken out of their pockets. People want to hear more about money going into their pockets. So it'll be it'll be a debate, I think, for the next four years. And my feeling has always been that where there's uncertainty, take advantage of uh, areas of opportunity now. Um, so again, things like uh, if you do have family members who are younger that you would like to gift to, this is about as good of a time as any to give to them. Who knows what that looks like in the future? Uh, estate taxes and when you pass away, who knows what that looks like? You know, it, I remember uh, less than soon after I got into practice, more than a decade ago, uh, the estate tax exemption for the federal government was six hundred seventy-five thousand dollars. Well, now it's eleven point five eight million dollars. Uh, realistically, does that look like a, one of the fresh areas for them to change around tax policy? Most likely, so. Again, a great time to, you know, without trying to, to sell your professionals too much, whether they're us or somebody else, a uh, great time to start talking to people and asking them in their respective professions what they think is going to be taking place in the near future and what you can do to take advantage of those opportunities. Uh, I wanted to thank Michael Luffman and Edward Zhang again. Thank you so much for your time. If anyone has any questions, I always recommend that you reach out to the people whose names are in front of you right now. And if you have any questions for me as well, please feel free to do it. Michael, Ed, thank you so much. What a pleasure working with you. And we appreciate your time today. Thanks, Ed. Thank you.